cat in the background? Yeah, there's certainly a cat. Is, is, is she a bit much? The, the big story over here, for all the fans of the show who have been taking in all the other storylines and so on, is that I'm now a cat grandpa. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Big news. So if you hear squeaking throughout this and they're being very vocal at the moment, oh, she's licking her babies. Oh, wow. Yes. So the, the neighborhood cat that I talked about on the last episode that was bringing all the boys to our yard gave birth in our closet just behind here. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, it, it was one of the most amazing things. So Adelia and I were watching this cat get progressively more pregnant, right, over the course of weeks. And we're like, it's, it's got to go any day now, like any day now. She's like a balloon. Like we can see all these like lumps in the side of her belly. It just didn't look normal. For three weeks, she looked like she was on the cusp of pregnancy. And one day she came up to us in a fit of howling and um, convulsions actually and we were in the kitchen this is kind of nuts have you ever seen a cat give birth uh yes i lived on a farm when I was a kid right <laughs> right, right <laughs> lots of right. barn ca barn cats <laughs> <laughs> right but I'd, ne I'd never seen it right I'd, i've had cats in my life before but they kind of arrived as kittens already and and this head came out of the back end of the cat the pregnant cat and then it went in again <laughs> He saw a shadow. So, so, yeah, so, so it peered out, this little black head just peered out, half a head, and then it went back in again, and the cat was like, I'm not happy, I need to Distressed. be comfortable, I need to go to a safe place, dark, no noises, and so on. So I just opened up the, the doors to the office, which is where I am today, and the cat runs in, goes straight into the second level of the wardrobe, which was open, and, and just made, makes a little nest on the second level of the wardrobe, and then... Five minutes later, this little cat kind of squishes out again and she's, the cat's running around and the baby is like half hanging out of the back end of the cat. And then it comes out and calms down. She starts licking it. So we basically watch her give birth to four cats over a period of about two hours. Yeah. Going in and out. Just four, huh? that's beautiful. all? Yeah, just four. Hmm. That's going to be enough. And today <laughs> they came out of the wardrobe for the first time. They're sleeping on the floor and... I think they're going to be walking in a day or two. That's great. I love yeah. cats, man. Yeah. I completely resonate with cats. I don't sleep at night. I, I run around the neighborhood yelling, crawl back home. I'm like a cat. I'm a night, a night cat. Yeah. So it, it's funny to watch myself as a, as a cat grandpa, right? Like going down the supermarket, <laughs> like at 10 o'clock at night when I really don't want to be like, well, I need to get some cat litter because... It's not going to be able to go in the middle of the night and it needs to teach the babies where to go and all that kind of stuff. You don't want it's a commitment, to... Jordan. You have to think ahead now. Well, these are the experiences I would never have had if it wasn't for COVID. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> I'd never had to have uh, settled down and take responsibility over things like cats. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's great. So that's where we are. That's where I am uh, in the office today. What's on your background there? It's a so new this background. Is, these are my kind of harebrained schemes for art creation, world mm. domination, themes of future projects. So I've got, I've got our essentials course, which is over there, actually. Uh -huh. I've got the legacy course, which is forthcoming and directly behind me. Mm -hmm. We've got mastery on this wall, which you cannot see because it's going to ruin the entire podcast setup. And over here, we've got a little bit of yoga that I was studying that I'm twisting and implementing yeah. in new ways for our programs. So it's, it's full. That's great. You know, we're always torn between, should we conquer the world or, or, or uh, uh, how does it conquer the world or save it? <laughs> Can't decide. Should we be villains? <laughs> Maybe we are. Villains or saviors. Yeah. <laughs> they, all, they all weave together in a supply, in a, into a surprising climax. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. At least there's a consistency. What's, uh, what's going on on your end of things? Well, uh, we, have a, we just had our Amirati conference here, as you know, a virtual conference, but we had about 10 guys in town who managed to brave the borders and flight restrictions and quarantine and lockdowns, et cetera. Yeah. And we had a, a really nice experience, and there's still several guys dangling around in, in the city, and uh, we'll probably see them this weekend and going for lunch with them, et cetera. It's been nice to have that, that outlet and to to sit with our, our, our um, brethren again, you know, our esteemed veterans. 
our esteemed veterans. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and our mentors yeah. and various things like that. So we've had some great conversations, some great parties. Uh, social distancing, of course, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Life's got to go on, man. Yeah. So that's what we've been doing. And uh, it's getting a little bit more energetic here in Romania because there's the, the, the second wave or the cases are going up. And so people are, they locked the restaurants down again yesterday. Oh, we used to, they opened it up a few weeks ago. That you could go inside restaurants and now they said, no, no, that's a little too premature. So, so we're just still kind of like, you know, I've been reading a lot. I've been listening to audio books now for the first time in my life. You are Since now I, an audio book. You popped your audio book cherry in both directions. Yeah. Because, because I finally, for people, some of you who might not know this, I finally recorded the audio version of the alabaster girl my book and uh it was difficult 10 days with my head stuck in a closet this wide with you know clothes hanging around me and the microphone in there so we could dampen it because this uh the studio apartment i have is too echoey and i'm sitting leaning in the in there like this into the microphone staring at the little iphone in front of my face and, and scrolling and reading it incredibly hard and uh but we did it and I don't know how it's going to turn out because uh, I don't know how to, I'm a dynamic reader or, well, it might sound like I'm just reading it, which I kind of am. I don't know, but I'm nervous about it. So, but it's being post-processed now. Be curious to hear it. It's beautiful, the conditions under which the podcast was made. Like, I want to talk a lot about art today, make a podcast surprise, surprise about art and beauty and so on. Um, but the story of the great works, the conditions under which they were made, I don't think were oh. ever perfect. You know, like I built nope. the desk and I got the easel and I got the perfect kind of top of the range brushes and paint and I was just ready to go. And then the, the sublime inspiration came through me. I think it's much more <laughs> back of a napkin, riding across somewhere in the back of some banged up car or with a head in the wardrobe somewhere with an ambulance yeah. going by or... It's you all know, uncertainty and doubt. Up in, the, in the middle of the night, you go and look at your work and the cat's eating the notepad type thing. Or you hate it. You look at the work and you think this is like Stephen King, when he wrote, I think it was Carrie was his first novel. He, was, he threw the manuscript into the fireplace and his wife rescued it before he was a writer, rescued it. Oh, she hated it so much. And she rescued it and, you know, and, he, and saved it basically. Was it a success? Yeah, oh yeah, it was like a bestseller, and it made it launched him into what he is. And he threw it away. It was scary, yeah. And you know, you know, and uncertainty and doubt. Da Vinci's apparently Leonardo da Vinci's last words were something to the effect of, "In all my work, in everything I tried to do and create, I failed before man and God." <laughs> yeah. Just you know, every, it's all uncertainty and doubt. I I, I was reading about. Uh, uh, Tolkien, who wrote the, the 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 Ring trilogy, the Lord of the Rings, yeah. he was he, he wrote he wrote a journal at the same time he's writing that, and <laughs> and letters, and his whole journal is filled with with what the heck am I going to do now? And he'd be stuck for six months on his book because he couldn't solve a problem that he, you know, and he didn't know what to do, and he was like frustrated, wanted to scrap it, and changed everything, and just throughout the end he was full of doubt. And if you looked at it today, you would think, wow, this guy created this entire world with a language and, and it's so coherent and it goes from here to here and it makes all kinds of sense. And he, was, he had it all, in, yeah, no, he picked at it and, 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 and was disgusted with it. Incredible. That's, that's so, the history of art. <laughs> to, to give you an update, like a little bit of a disclaimer, I've been, I think it's a consequence of these conversations we've been having and just the bigger questions of the Yaza Murata. Like, what, what does it mean to create a, uh, uh, what are we, uh, a path, a, uh, a transformational program, a art and kind of literary house? Yeah, a, a body tradition. of work. A body of yeah, work. A, a communal yeah. body of work or a congregation or a kind of movement, like all these various things. A, yeah. a part of what we're doing and and of course i'm more and more interested in um restoring beauty more and more uh wanting to go in my artistic direction um 
as a uh, mm -hmm. uh, something fresh that draws me in a way that like and and finding stability and success with coaching as well i'm i'm feeling wow like i've really got that particular chapter of my life which was a real long slog <laughs> myself and have experience and learn how like the business of coaching and all that kind of stuff works to feel myself yeah. with i would say fingertips on the table of arrival in that sphere it kind of frees me up to think about like what what really brings me passion to my days and really lights me up and for sure a lot of the conversations i have do that but there's a there's a hunger for art and the the artistic process that is uh scream it's not even a whisper it's kind of screaming at me like take days off entire days off so you can plunge into this world mm -hmm. um and it's pulling me forth a lot and it and it's something mm -hmm. i've been thinking about and and feeling and practicing more and more um the relationship with the with the daemon mm -hmm. so this innate kind of life force natural intelligence the innate creativity of a human this kind of soul force of a person that wants to burst through and express something or has some kind of um i don't know knowledge or impression or imprint that he knows from the dream world let's say mm -hmm. metaphorically mm -hmm. and he wants to bring that back and put it into the waking world as an artifact for other people to see i love that process and i know from when i watch art and i see because it's not all the time but when i see a musician or i see a dancer or i see somebody who's clearly gone into some other realm entirely and has succeeded in coming back and translating what they've felt and it hits you like a transmission to watch that is there's nothing more sublime than passing my days in that kind of war and reverence of yeah watching beauty be channeled and transmitted by someone who's devoted themselves to the mastery of it and in the in the few flickering moments in my life where I felt myself in that kind of space, I was, I was, I'll check this out with you, actually. I was telling Adelia today, um, I was talking about writing. And my sense is, is of the creative process. And I think we finished the last podcast, you were talking about this kind of, there is the newer sphere beyond me and ideas might seep through somehow. And if I miss it, then I don't worry too much because someone else might get it and the collective you know, unconscious in the world right collective unconscious as uh, jung called it yeah there, there's something about writing or creating at my best where i feel like 95 percent of me has has slipped out of the waking world and gone into some shamanic realm hmm. and is actually feeling and, and thinking and picking up on all kinds of uh play and images and memories and and uh strange connections in there so 95% of my being is in that. And then there's just 5% like typing away on the keyboard, hoping that my hands can keep up with the discoveries <laughs> that I'm making in that other realm, right? So it's like, wow. I might clear my head, is this making sense? Blah, blah, blah. Is this coherent? But that's pretty brilliant, Jordan, because- I'm going back. Because all artists, writers, et cetera, are trying to tap into that. And they yeah. sit in their mundane world and they sit at their, with their cup of coffee and they're staring out the window and the muse doesn't alight on their shoulder or they don't, they don't get that sense of inspiration and they sit there and pick at it, you know? So yeah. if you're having that, that's pretty profound because most, most writers, et cetera, are just staring out the window. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's not a day by day thing, you know, I'm, I'm not claiming to be in this kind of virtuoso level of kind of creative shamanism, but you know, I'm opening up Facebook and just seeing what someone wrote and, surfing and see if anything good happened on youtube overnight and like the rest of us but yeah um what's i, I want to talk about this connection with the daemon and okay. um which is exactly what i just expressed and another thought hit me which is i think that many of the men in particular that are drawn to our message there's two or three things that they don't have or they don't have access to yet. And it's the same in being a lover as it is in being the artist. Like these two realms for me are so close and similar in, in the bulk of them. And I think it like one of the big ones is to stop sourcing your energy on something external to you, i.e. the guys who say, I always feel really good and inspired after an Amirati conference, but then after a week or two, my energy yeah. goes down to the floor right and where can i you get all the ton of comments like that yeah yeah so 
the, 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 the need for, to find our life force somehow and then to look outside to try and get it from women, to get it from community, to get it from peak experiences and so on, versus to source yourself in your own demonic energy, your own creative kind of madman brilliance. Yeah. And I want to hear, I'll stop jabbering on, but I want to hear your perspectives of like, how, how do you get to the, the essence or the source in you? Or what is it like when you're creating at your best? And any right. words about cultivating that relationship to the... Yeah, first of all, it's to, to come to alignment with you on your definition of daemon. I think, you know, the ancient Greeks had the concept of the daemon, which was a benevolent spirit that would visit you. Is that right? Yes, that's what I'm going on. So rather yeah. than the demon, which okay. is... I'm plagued by my demons, you know, the... I'm plagued by my um, demon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damn it. Do you want me to do something? Something great and benevolent. <laughs> okay, that's exactly. what I was wondering. And, and, and he's bursting through, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. certainly not advocating a life of being plagued by demons or even beckoning demons into existence <laughs> for a curious form of art. There's a very big distinction there. Um, I think that that any no, the mo, the only noble pursuit of anybody is to try and tap into that voice calling in the wilderness what i would call it you know the biblical term it's like it's like the prophet you know is is speaking and and the people don't listen so the modern uh, modern postmodern civilization that we ex that we inhabit turns their back on that and says there is nothing to tap into, like we talked about the last thing, you know, like it, ever since the enlightenment, I suppose, um, we've had this idea of humanism is the center. And there is nothing beyond our, our chemical experience that we could just, you know, evolution's tapped into that and, you know, all these different things. And there is no meaning and there is no transcendence and there is no mysticism that, that cannot be explained eventually by a scientific thing. So you, what you detect and what we're detecting in this modern world, especially in this modern world of uh, disconnection and, and, and so, uh, so, so, you know, solitude, um, that people are starving and hungry for a, a tapping into what you're calling the daemon, you know, that, that creative force, that creative energy that gives us force. And um, it's incredible, you know, in our last episodes of this podcast, we've talked about this in, in a great length, motivation, you know, where the history of, of, of art and literature, the, the, the turning our face away from beauty. So uh, I'm, I'm speaking very generally to answer your question because I don't have a specific answer to your question, but I think this, this entire conversation could be an answer no, it can be an expiration of that question. Yeah. Right? I think so. So, I mean, like, you know, since the Renaissance and in the Enlightenment, which is like, it, they turned away from mysticism as, imagine the societies before the Enlightenment, all societies in all of history, in every spectrum of this, of, of the, of across the world were, it's like there's, there's rivers and oceans and society before the enlightenment was like a river. So if you're born in England, you're born in China, you're born, whatever you get into the river with everybody else. And you have no choice to believe anything else than the official religion of that tribe or that area. Right. And you wouldn't consider it. You would not even think, you know, and since then the modern societies are more like oceans where you can, you can, you can drift with, the, with whatever prevailing tide, with whatever, whatever wind, or you can sit there and do nothing and choose no direction, or you can shift directions through your life, become one you know, religious person or religious uh, idea, and then follow another new age concept and go to Catholicism, and it's the drifting. And the, before the Enlightenment, before the Renaissance, to even mention that to somebody in any civilization, they think you're nuts. How could you possibly do that? No, you, society sets your beliefs and you follow the stream. You follow the river. It's something that's really, really strongly shifted. We had, you know, I think it was uh, uh, the German philosopher, uh, Jasper, I think, talked about the axial age. 
and axial means the pivotal age. And that was from about 300 or, or you know, 800 BC to 300 BC. And the axial age was in India, in Persia, in, in China, in uh, Greco-Roman civilizations, the flowering of ideas that weren't existing before blossomed, you know, in, in science and medicine and in religion, all the great religions started, you know? Yeah. And uh, without any contact with each other, parallel, they came up with similar ideas of, of civilization, ethics, etc., that didn't exist before. And it just, it, 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 and it blossomed. So, um, <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering, like, so what, what's, your, what's your part to play in that? Like, you're laying out this massive historical context of, like... Well, I'll tell you. This is the... Innovation this is the, landed, yeah. This is the Arja Murata philosophical attempt of contribution. A, attempting, attempt to contribute. Um since the 50s for sure since, well since the 19, 1900 perhaps all culture that used to be handed down from in tradition right tradition traditional culture high culture what we could call high high, high culture highbrow or lowbrow right like the common people would play their fiddles and and do the jig and plunk 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 on the piano and the highbrow would be all sophisticated mozart and you know beethoven etc and what, what has happened in this last 100 and whatever years is the commercialization of all this into a pop culture. And, it's, and that, that pop culture, that commercialized pop culture, the Disneyfication of culture completely eroded everything highbrow and lowbrow and melted all into the one giant global cosmolo cosmopolitan culture of commercialization and it's all you know pre-recorded pre-invented pre-designed uh, uh um focus group tested the whole thing and the problem is with this disnification of culture is it subsumed and gobbled up anything else remaining you know anything else so it's all about um it's all of the, the culture today is all about commercialization and it doesn't sell like a, an ad or an advertising jingle does not sell the product it sells happiness it sells belonging it sells wholeness you don't want to buy the beer you want to be like those guys in the beer commercial right you want those right. that's what that's what it's selling so yeah. what we've lost in this really and it's a real religion of rush and the, and the whole idea of this rushing culture especially in the last 20 years where social media has taken the world by storm, taken our culture by storm to, in, in ways we haven't imagined and the ways that the human race was not ready for. Realistically, it's like, it's overwhelmed us. It's, it's, it's destroyed the concept of media, destroyed the concept of, you know, all these things. And so our, we're trying to catch up and it's running too fast for our, our, our collective souls to, to understand. So there's a real, you know, the postmodern, the postmodern age can be said to be a scattered age because it's, it's, we had Newton who said, you know, who, who, who came from mysticism and religion and said, wait a minute, we're starting with the, the enlightenment age where science is supreme, humanistic view is supreme, all these things, right? And then what happened is, uh, the turn of the century with quantum physics and all this uncertainty principles and the, it, it, and realizing we just realized in the last hundred years, this, that the universe is so huge. We had no idea before, you know? And so it puts a bunch of uncertainty into literature, into cultures, into, and, and so now everybody can be in this ocean and pick any drift you want. And there's, in fact, it's, it's you're you're looked at as strange if you follow a religion as opposed to the other way around and that was never in the history of the world you always followed a religion of some kind yeah so the idea is that because of this everything i'm 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 foaming at the mouth for all this 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 entire subject but the idea that that there's a turning back or a desire to turn back 
to what to to beauty to a beautiful experience to a calming experience to go back into the tr- to 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 reinvent rediscover the transcendent and the sublime you know and that's what's starving that's why you've got those things on the wall because men and women are completely devoid there's no place to turn you can't look at art anymore you can't look at architecture you can't look at science you can't look at there's no it, it's all it's all been you know any kind of sense of aesthetic or or uh, uh, element or beauty has been slapped away as like huh, non-interesting or trite and it's wrong so yeah so that's our so, that's our collective mission restoring beauty so in this scattered centerless universe that we're all um trying to navigate our way through one of the important things i wanted to add to your list of things under the disnification is that once entertainment becomes pre-recorded then most people just become passive consumers of it so i I think just the sheer number of musicians artists writers um participatory creators of the arts is probably kind of percentage wise in our culture has been lower than it's ever been Mm, okay and there's my sense i mean yeah because it's mass produced now People celebrate the fact that you can kind of post instantly to Instagram or Facebook yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And everybody's an author and everybody's a... Yeah. yeah, but it's such a fast pace and uh, driven by other motives activity that mm-hmm. I think there's relatively little artistic purity. Well, at least coming on my Facebook feed. <laughs> it's right. quite heavily uh, antagonistic and politicized. So I, I, I think... My question, actually, I want, I want to say one of the most beautiful things I remember being with you guys in Las Vegas of all places years ago. Um, and it felt to me like the most bohemian experience that I'd ever had <laughs> in that. I remember that. Coming home, coming home from whatever daily thing that we were doing, there would be at least three people in the house at once, like all vying to have the guitar or to share a song that they've been practicing or writing for the day. And other people would be outside on the porch storytelling and so on. And it's like, well, there's like actually actual people who are creating things. Like we might have been 50 or a hundred years ago. Well, there is no entertainment. There is no pre-recorded entertainment. So we have to create our own. And actually like so many of the people drawn to our message are longing for that kind of experience. I want to go traveling to some place in time where I can be in a room of people who are actually participating and creating and sharing authentically because to sing in front of a group of people in a house party is you got to be authentic, authentic. right? <laughs> like the, 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 to share yourself in that way is, is very, very foreign. Um, no wonder we struggle in with like flirting, intimate playfulness when so many of us are never trained in, in sharing our souls or sharing ourselves artfully in any yeah, kind social of way. graces. We don't, right. We don't, we have no social communion. The, the word is communion. What, you know, to sit in that in house in Vegas or wherever we've been, it's a great sense of communion with, with others. You're, you're sitting, you know. Yes. And, and what the, the thing that makes this communion important is that there's not a, uh, a widescreen TV with some Netflix series that can save our asses meaning that I can avoid actually sharing yeah, myself yeah. within this gathering because we're going to triangulate all our attention on this prepackaged entertainment. But actually there's no entertainment in the room. Like your ass is not saved. You have to kind of show <laughs> up and speak your voice, speak yeah. your, your demonic energy to the group and have that be received or derided or included and twisted or whatever people do with it. But yeah, you, oh, go ahead. Yeah. My, my question under all this was like in this um distracted entertainment saturated um not trained as creators of the arts or of self-expression in general like within this whole panorama that you laid out at this point Mm -hmm. in history um how do you do your tiny little thing as a as a one person kind of ant speck out there in the ocean um where and how do you turn towards something in order to c- 
create what is meaningful or beautiful to you? Wow, that's, that's a great question. Like on a personal level, how do you manifest that in your yeah. life, in, you, in your corner of the world, in your community, et cetera? Yeah. Because that's a big question that I'm certain everybody that's interested in this podcast is sitting in. How do I personally do that? You know, how do I personally restore beauty given yeah. my extreme limitations? And yeah. we're all extreme. I think limited. it's like, it's like yes, tapping it's into the, 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 it's tapping into the idea that we've lost of wonder to be sitting in massive wonder about this time in history, about our perspective in it. You know, it's, we could, we could be sitting, we can be, cruising through the sky at hundreds of miles an hour, quietly sipping a coffee <laughs> and reading a book. If that doesn't feel someone with wonder, what will, <laughs> you know, that just, that blows my mind. <laughs> or, or you can have, you can, <laughs> right? You're quietly drinking a coffee. How is this possible? And then the history of, of, of man from the, you know, cavemen to now, they're like, huh, no, no, that's not possible. And we have, we have in something the size of, of this, the, the, the size of this, we have 10,000 songs. You have Beethoven, you have, you, it's right there at your fingertips and we're, and we have blasé and we're bored. Yeah. If that doesn't fill you with wonder what, what, what will. So it's- Every, every novel that was ever censored is now available for free. Right. On, on the tip of your Kindle, you know, people would be waiting 20 years to get their hands on a copy of Tropic of Cancer, for example. And yet, we're in depression, malaise, uh, uh, jaded, we're jaded. We're, we, we bitch about society, we bitch about everything, and it, everything's amazing. Like, that, who's, who's that, uh, the comedian said that? Everything's amazing and nobody's happy. Incredible, incredible. So it's like, so when you tap into back up and look at the perspective of your little one dot on this timeline of the universe, you're a, a tiny, not even a dot, you're a minus dot, <laughs> you know, uh, your lifespan, your perspective, et cetera. And you get to live in this great, amazing age where it's an age of wonder, but we don't have wonder. We have cynicism and we have... Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and we have aggression and, and, and we're, we're angry at our neighbors and we're angry at everything and, and we're angry at their phone won't, won't re reboot in, in 30 seconds instead of, you know, two minutes. Like we get angry about that. It's insane. So if you can tap back into the wonder of the, of the creation that you were, uh, of, of this experience that you're in right now, then you can talk about it with uh, aplomb and with sincerity and with, gravitas you know we can you can speak about it that people will listen it's um yeah it's uh it's this postmodern age which we which we're still inhabiting and nobody can define postmodernism of course or when it started or if it ended we have no idea but anyway it slips it's, through it's, your fingers and gets deconstructed as soon as you have a half decent stab right exactly and it's like it's a it's but it's based on uncertainty and disagreements in science and discord that arose from, from the world wars we had, World War I, World War II. Wait a minute, we thought society was, was progressing and, and brotherly love and human, humanity was coming together. And then that happened. And then mm -hmm. science was all orderly and, and Copernicus and Newton said, you know, it's a perfect uh, you know, ellipse and the universe has this mathematical coherence and then uncertainty came into it quantum uncertainty and like uh none of it makes sense on that level and no one can reconcile that no one can figure it out so um we sit in this we this is what we're inhabiting and we've lost well i, I won't repeat myself so uh w w there's basically in my mind there's three phases of modern society i guess you could say there's superstition and faith or mysticism and faith that's better superstition no mysticism and faith every culture in every part of the world uh up until the renaissance basically was was based on mysticism and faith and then rationality and we can think our way through this and we don't need 
we no longer need the help of mysticism. We can, it's humanism, rationality and humanism. And now we're in this age, this, this post uh, modern modernity age of uncertainty and doubt. Post and truth every, age. Every wind. This and truth. anything that you think is certain, like we'll deconstruct it. So we want to take away everyone's legs that they're standing on. Exactly. Um, right. Level the playing field. Um, so I, we're in this question because I inquired about um, what do we each do as individual specks out in the ocean right. in order to turn towards the transcendent? I think we could come back to that, right? unless you've... Well, I, yeah, let me comment a bit more about that because it doesn't mean that we all have to strive to create... Well, no, we do. It's a striving for art. You know, there's a distinction of art that art has no purpose it has no functionality. So for instance, a cabinet, a wooden cabinet can be aesthetically pleasing and be absolutely beautiful, but because it's functional, we don't call it high art because it has a utility. So um, I think that what that individual can do is to strive for art. Maybe he's not a painter or writer or, you know, a, a musician, but to create your, your life, and we talk about designing your life as a work of art so that you can look back on it when you're nine years old and go, man, I tried that and I did that and I did this. And, you know, uh, we talk about people that are, that are stuck in dead end jobs, dead end cities, dead end relationships. And the glory of casting that aside and renunciation and marching into a, an unknown, marching into an unknown to, to, to take ourselves at the, at the throat and go, I'm scared, but I'm going to, I'm gulping, but I'm going to do it anyway. And that's creating a life of art. So you can look back at the artistic uh, experience you created. And so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, the individual, the answer to that, to do your small part, to add to culture. Because when we do something like, if you and I go to London or Vancouver or something, and we create uh, weekend intensive, for instance, like we used to do, right? We do weekend intensive. Are we not ad adding to the culture of London? Yeah, in, in our in our infinitesimal, infinitesimal way, we are adding to the culture that that the, that city has experienced. It's adding something to it, even if it's like, <laughs> right? So you I, can I, do I, this I, in your little way. I, 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 just thinking about that, depending on the, the kind of orientation of the person out on a night out in London, they can either be stealing from the culture, like how can I break in here and not pay and just take as much experience as I can and then maybe repurpose it and take it somewhere else. I'm going to copy this particular aesthetic or this club and do it somewhere else. Yeah. Or you can be consuming the culture. Uh, I'm not adding anything to it, but I'm stood by the bar with my pint and I paid my entrance fee so that the people can go on doing their thing. But there's little self-expression being actually included in the space yeah you're not so adding. I, I, yeah I, I think to actually be able to say that you're creating or contributing to the culture you really have to be doing something generous and of self-expression like a case in point would be the um the facebook groups that we have and the different things that get shared there so okay, yeah you, you might get certain people that comment all the time hey where's the recording for this thing hey i didn't get my email hey you said this was going to be posted yesterday and it's not right. So that's yeah. one type of comment that we get often. And then you get another type of comment, which is guys, I had this experience the other day with a woman or a walk in the park or a trip that I made, or I went to the museum and this is what I saw and this is how it moved me. And, and this is the question I'm left with. And yeah. so that there's a real participatory quality, even in a Facebook group. And, and it's like that, that's how, you can be uh, adding to the stockpile of culture or just walking, walking yeah. through and doing a fart you know, in the middle of it without any connection. You added something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it, you know, it's interesting, Jordan, Jordan before, yeah. you go, before you go there, it's like what you're describing is this, and I just, it just occurred to me this, I never thought this before, but this sense of entitlement of this modern age was never in the history of any culture except for the monarchy and the aristocracy. They felt entitled, but that's trickled down to the common person where where's, where's my, you promised this and where, where, how come I don't have this? 
it's trickled down to the to the common for lack of a better phrasing um man uh the the common age as this sense of entitlement on the fundamental level that is because of part of our being we never had that in history mm-hmm. except for if you're you know of, of the, the top of the hierarchy and you're the kings and then you had super entitlement but that's trickled down to everyone now and so it's uh, I don't know what that means, but it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we've been forced in that. We've been trained in that. Like, yeah. what? My Uber is going to take more than 10 minutes? What the hell? Like, who do these people think they are? Stupid. <laughs> Incredible. I mean, my, delivery, my, my food delivery was 20 minutes yesterday, and they've been 45 minutes. They haven't even left me a notification. <laughs> the fire, like, ignited in the body. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to add some things on this. Um, uh, traditionalism or pre-modernism, modernism, post-modernism. Like, I got a degree in philosophy and I still couldn't untangle those words in terms okay, of each yeah. other in any real sense, right? It's taken me 10 or 15 years to actually wrap my head around what those mean. But um, what, what I've been looking into is understanding the, these movements and understanding what they do in the mentality and the psyche of people. And from there, the art comes and from the art, then these memes propagate even more and even more. So I, I can give an example, like modernism from, from how I understand it, there was a lot of uh, utopianism involved in that, which is- Yes, that's correct. Now, now that I've harnessed science, I can create this grand scheme for how humanity should live and, and yep. we're all gonna be in harmony. So the, the, the utopianism was like, I'm gonna lead humanity to a greater place. That's a beautiful, um, there's, there's such a beautiful goodness in that. Like personally, I think the modern period is some of my favorite literature and the, uh, I love that. But of course it all ended up in disaster because the grand schemes for humanity people had were communism and fascism and the yeah. kind of capitalist paradigm that a lot of us are living in now. Um, it destroyed that, that utopian ideal. It's destroyed. Yeah, like they, they try to yeah. make a utopia, but every utopia fails. In fact, the problem a lot of people have said is that the problem with utopianism is just your attempt to claim that you can actually create heaven on earth for everyone in all moments, in all ways. And there has to be a reconciliation with the, um, you know, th- this is not going to be ever fully anyone's individual version of utopia, but there can be great flourishings of humanity and, and good things. But then the postmodern age comes along and after the, uh, the world wars and the genocides and so on, it says basically any attempt to try and put your heart on your sleeve and, and call forth a great vision for humanity um, is ultimately going to end up in disaster. Why even try? Yeah, futility. I, so the cynicism yeah. comes in at this point. Mm-hmm. And I've been looking at because I think cynicism is probably the one of the greatest ingredients to wrap our heads and our hearts around and truly understand how it lives in us and lives in others because it's the one ingredient that's going to enable you to fall in love or not and have a deeply nourishing relationship like if you're cynical about love like a lot of people are oh yeah it's all right to be this playboy guy but fall in love (laughs) whatever (laughs) men and women with their own cynicism it's the ultimate kind of poison or barrier around feeling like really letting yourself go and communing with another person. Um, and also in the arts. And I think the, the one conclusion that, because cynicism comes out in snark, snark culture. It's very safe yeah. to be skeptical. It's very safe to be cynical. It's very safe to be snarky because all I can do is throw daggers at other people and I never have to expose any utopianistic hope for a better <laughs> world or, or a personal longing. Um, I, you, you can no. be absolutely buttressed from the world of um, violence, bullying, abuse, derision. Like if you're cynical, you're safe. And comedy has become cynical and sitcoms have become cynical and men and women have learned these ways of talking to each other and they sit there on the date and the woman is cynical because it's self-protection. She can, not, she can avoid yeah. having to be vulnerable because she's cynical. The man doesn't know any way to get through either. So he becomes cynical. And you've got these two people that are absolutely walled off. So like, Dating in this postmodern world, my God, you know, I've needed years and years of help to understand and like wrap my head around what is going on. The men we work with as well. How can I connect with a woman in my area when, you know, everyone is entrained in, in this air of cynicism. Yeah. And if I'm actually sincere, then I might get 
derided or hurt really badly. Yeah. Yeah. If you're sincere and yeah. authentic. So we learn very early. Don't be, don't be authentic. Don't put your heart in your sleeve. Don't express your true feelings so because you're going to get burned. Yeah. Culturally, romantically, artistically, I think we're deep into a cul-de-sac where very few people can see a guiding light to take them in another direction. And I've seen, I sent you a little video, maybe post this below about um, post irony and meta irony. <laughs> Which so these, is a very postmodern experience. Right, I didn't see it. What, right, so it's going beyond. So the, the idea of irony and, and uh, caustic wit and yeah. satire is a very postmodern thing. They talk a lot about the boomer satire, like not jokes and this kind of stuff, like actually basic, pretty boring um, irony. Memes, memes are all, yeah. Yeah. yeah and and so there is a new breed of memes like the millennial memes post irony which is you become so ironic at the nature of doing irony that you're now double irony so you're you're like i'm being ironic but am i being ironic and and so i'm ironically it, ironic yeah <laughs> it, it, it it's actually really sweet and beautiful it's like um the humor has become so multi-layered and hyper um contextual and strange that it can be quite unnerving and unsettling and jarring and that there can be a sweetness in that but what it what it <laughs> leaves an individual in is say if you go on a date with somebody or you want to you know proclaim your work to the world you're being ironic about being ironic or even about being ironic you've got so many different layers of irony you can't stand on your feet anymore and say this is who i am this is how i feel and and this is what i'm seeing a lot of people struggling with um being stuck in ways of showing up and being, being uh, trapped within a particular sense of humor that um, keeps them being ironic about being ironic. It's very hard, I Imagine. think right now, to put your two feet on the ground and, and just say something blunt, direct. Yeah. Imagine literature, you know, which is the modern sense of literature, which is all memoir. Imagine the irony of 20 year olds writing their memoir. And they're taught yeah. this. They're taught this. If you take a creative arts class in any university, the, your assignment is to write your memoir. It's like, huh? It's a, that's an ironical thing if you, if, if you imagine it, you know? So, yeah, it's like you can play around with everything now because there's no certainty in the world anymore, apparently. So you can play around with the breaking the fourth wall, you know, like injecting yourself into the art. The artist mm -hmm. now becomes, becomes the primary thing as, as opposed to the artwork, right? Is, is that what the fourth wall means? No, the fourth wall is like, comes from uh, theater, I guess, and from it, there's three walls and the actors are here and they're talking to each other on the stage. But when yeah. they address the audience, they break the fourth wall. And that's ironical. Okay. That's, a, yeah. that's an, you know, so that in, in, in a movie, it's, or, or if you're watching a TV show or a movie and they turn to the camera and say something to the camera, that's, that's breaking the fourth wall. Got it. Yeah. And, yeah. So uh, in, in literature, when the narrator actually starts saying, Hey, I'm yeah. the meta angle. Hey, I'm writing a book here. And this yeah, is, I'm going to write the uh, Calvino and, and, and Umberto Eco, these Italian, you know, writers, and they very much broke that fourth wall the name of the rose and Calvino's works where he basically said, I'm going to write you an, I'm going to write a novel about this and you, and, and here's what I'm going to tell you in the novel. And it's, <laughs> you know, and, and that's the, I mean, James Joyce was the, was the, the one that took the, that Cer Cervantes and, you know, you, you know, started the idea of the modern novel and Defoe and all this kind of stuff. And then James Joyce took it to the absolute extreme of, of deconstruction, I guess you could say. And, uh, you know, as soon as the modern novel was invented, it was deconstructed immediately, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, so it's, uh, um, that ironical, satirical, satirical, the satire uh, has, has become supreme because uh, and irony is mixed media. So imagine this, we, we've got the, the ultimate uh, pastiche. Pastiche is the idea that you take, you know, you know, different things and you stick it into your painting. Here's a piece of newspaper, a collage, right? That's a pastiche, or, or you're writing a, a, a novel, the modern no novel that we have today, and it's got different voices and different perspectives and unreliable narrators, you know, in this <laughs> modern age, right? The unreliable, should we believe it or not? And when you think of hypertext, which is the internet, 
That's the ultimate pastiche. So you've got something here, but it's also including everything else that's ever been said about that subject in a hypertext. Wikipedia, yeah. for instance, right? It's, it's amazing. Yeah. It's a, I don't know what age we're in. <laughs> I have no idea. It's, it's the age of playing around with structure, playing around with narrative, playing around with traditional story themes. We talk, you know, Joseph Campbell talked about the hero's journey and that's yeah. been injected and everything. And that's being ripped Tired. apart and, 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 and timelines going backwards and, and no plots. Well, my book doesn't have a plot, for instance. <laughs> maybe, very, maybe it's very postmodern. It has, no, right. it has no, no story, no plot. No. You know, when I was, when I, when I was going to publish that book, I ended up publishing it myself, but I went to New York about a year before it was finished. Most people didn't know this. And I beat the streets and I knocked on the doors and I went and talked to agent, literary agents because New York is the publishing hub of the world, right? right. I went to publishing companies. I, I set up all these appointments and I went to them. And they said, okay, we read the first uh, 40 pages of your book. Uh, I'm just sitting in a boardroom and these, these publishing executives sitting there, but we don't, you have to change it because it, what is it? Uh, they would say, it's not a story. It's not fiction. It's not nonfiction. It's not self-help. It's not a business book. It's not, not any of these things. It, where are we going to put it on the shelf was the thing they kept saying to me. We're, we have no idea how to, where it, it doesn't fit into any genre. We can't put it on the shelf anywhere. So it's, I guess it's a very postmodern book if I think about it now. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd love to see on your Wikipedia page, you know, in 50 years when <laughs> you've gone to the next, the next realm. Uh, it says, Zam Perrion's in interesting work has been labeled as the epitome of postmodern literature. Yeah, the, the yeah. end of postmodernism. <laughs> <laughs> and then we went back to a real authentic period yeah, you know <laughs> this this one man's musings was just this bridge too far <laughs> it's like it's enough tell a story <laughs> who all right like so if we bring it back to the 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 perspective of the speck in the ocean right which is yeah. really the only perspective we we can really know with that much intimacy um how do these different movements and uh trends and maybe ways of being inspired or maybe ways of being tired by what you see yeah. influence the things that you're creating. And like, I'd, I'd be curious to hear if stru structurally, thematically, aesthetically, um, you're either working with um, new innovations or feelings that you're bringing in, or if you've seen something really lately that's created a massive impact on you. Oh. Me personally, right? Yeah. 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 Um, I'm writing a second book, as most of you know, as you know, and I'm dancing around the themes because I don't want to, I, I can't write anything absolute. I can't say for, I can't write about postmodernism, for instance. I can't say, okay, this is what we're in. I can't talk about, excuse me, I can't talk about the age of men and women, the dynamic, dynamic age of men and women with any certainty. You know, so I'm kind of struggling in, with that dance around it and trying to capture something that I can sense that I, that you, as, is there something I've discovered that I know to, to, sh to pick up in a shovel and, and share it, you know? No, um, I don't have that, but I, I don't have that surety of knowing that I have something concrete that's going to be of value. But I have this strong, strong intimation, a strong intuition, a strong sense that there's something lurking just beyond my sensory perception in the transcendent realm, I guess you could say, that wants to be born, that wants to, that wants to, that wants to come through in some way. So like you said, you're tapping into that, that the concept of the, of, of the daemon as you're, as you're creating and you're, and you're, I'm, I'm looking for that aspect. I'm not sitting here going, oh, the muse doesn't, is not touching me. It's not like that. It's like, uh, I want to say something. I want to write something that's real. It's not an answer. 
and it's not it's not a conclusion it's not something's going to save the world there's not something's going to be a solution to anything but i want to write something that has uh what i want i know what i want in my book i can see the cover of it i know the title of it i know the content of it i can see it in my i can feel it in my hands i smell it every day i think about it but i'm i'm trying to shape something into the narrative of it that captures that into that intuition that i have about that there's something else that, that there's something to, to pull into it and I, I know that's very abstract are you um huh. are you capturing or working to capture the zeitgeist yeah but i don't want to talk about the zeitgeist i don't want to yeah. talk about modern society and and where it went wrong and the age that we're in and maybe this and because too many cliches yeah and it's 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 too many voices talking about that. And I don't want to talk politics. I don't want to talk any of this stuff. I want to talk about the essence of wonder and beauty and try and capture the sense of that again, I think. So, so that someone who reads it might think, well, now maybe I can strive for that kind of understanding too in my life as a work of art. I can create my life as a work of art. And I don't mean self-help, create a life of excellence. And I'll teach you the, 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 the three points of excellence so that you can, that's self-development, self-help. And it's not that at all. You know, it's, um, it's it be the literature? tradition of literature came down to us, you know. Is it literature what you're creating? <laughs> well, I would like to think so. But, you know, it's like saying like I'm a philosopher. You know, you know, like it's others call you a philosopher. You, you call yourself a philosopher. You're like, what? You know, it's like, it's like, yeah, no. So philosophy is something that is created out of someone who's got a very curious mind and, and, and post his, after his, his uh, ruminations, people say, wow, that was, that's philosophy. That's a philosopher. As opposed to somebody say, I'm going to be a philosopher. I'm starting today my new job as a philosopher, right? It, 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 it's like a contrived thing. And I think literature could be the same thing to say that I'm, I'm trying to write literature. Literature is something that is bestowed upon, that's a, that's a, a, a canon or a, a label that's bestowed upon something that, the, that people judge to be literature after it was done. You can't say yeah. that I'm trying to, you know, understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, set I, out to write literature. It's something that I wondered about because I haven't done a, a degree in literature or really um, kind of know this, but the very definition of literature is like when does something become a work of literature as opposed to a paperback novel? Yeah, a, I mean, like, look at look at detective page turner or whatever it is. Thriller. Look at T.S. Eliot. He wrote uh, the Ballad of, of of Proof Rock. He wrote The Wasteland, and his in, his stated goal of his of what he was trying to do was to take the, the, the English language and the sophistication of the English language and make it accessible to the common person so that, it could, so that the English language would trickle down and infuse the, 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 the voices and the, and the writing and the, the common... Uh, and guess what we have today? <laughs> Emojis. Uh, the word C is a letter C now. It's like, you know, it's like, it's all... So uh, advertising jingles, uh, this... this, this our language has been completely, the English language has been completely destroyed into these little tiny like emojis, you know, it's essentially, which is the opposite of what he thought would happen with his, his poetry would bring this language. Such, down. such a utopianistic idea. Yeah. <laughs> and look at language today. It's completely fractured and, 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 and a pastiche as we talked about earlier. Yeah. Incredible. It's, it's dumbed down. It's actually language is dumbed down. If you text something, it's like, it's dumbed down. It's not, it's not high art or sophisticated. So whether that's good or bad, I have no idea, but it is what it is. So you, you try and set out to create a work of art. You know what? I don't think you can create a work of art. I think we talked about this in the very first episode of this show. You can only create something that, that makes you pause, makes you cry. Something... The Alabaster Girl is a book I wanted to read, and it wasn't out there. There was, n there was nothing. 90% of that book 
95% of the book I never saw anywhere else in the world before or since. Nothing. Yeah. Came out of my, my vomited experience. I wanted, to, I wanted to capture something that I, that I saw and experienced. And so it's, it's um, you can't create, you can't set out to create art that is in, in, with quotations around the, you know, the artistic experience. You can only create something that you would love that would make you cry, that would make you pause, make you contemplate. If you have a painting that you've done and you can put it on your wall and look at it and think, you know, like Picasso said, man, you know, it's, it's not what I wanted to do. All artists know this, what they, what they put down on paper, they put down in, into music, or they put down into, into, into the visual arts, the plastic arts, they call it, right? like painting and stuff like that, is never what they really wanted to, to, to capture. It approximated it and it's not, it wasn't quite it, but it never really landed. You know, it's, it's like, there's something else. And, and, but the beauty of it is that we did that attempt, that they did that, you know, attempt at that. So art is something like literature that is bestowed upon it post creation. Is it art? Yeah. Is a cabinet art? It's functional. So we wouldn't call it art. We'd say it's artistic, but you know, it's not, you can put it in a museum, maybe, a, maybe in the museum of modern art, art, you know, in the furniture section. Yeah. I was really, I was really re reflecting this morning on, um, so I'm 38 next month. And I was feeling what a wonderful age to start turning my face more with more dedication towards art or whatever that might mean yeah. in terms of my own creations. And, and I say that, I don't say that in a way to dissuade anyone who's not in this particular age bracket. I know you were 40 when you uh, packed up your kind, kind of modern yeah. life and threw, threw your hat in the ring to go full time yeah. expressing the, de the daemon. Um, I, I think when I was traveling in my early 20s, I read Kerouac and a bit of Nabokov and um, all kinds of people, especially people that were writing about the road. The road, and, yeah. Uh, fancied myself as a writer. And I think in the, in the <laughs> early 20s, it's such a dangerous time to want to write because all of your pretenses and hopes of being recognized by the adult world as being a success and have having made it will filter into your creations and ultimately stultify your attempts of saying something that's true. And I think hmm. often, not always, but often um, a younger person or at least a younger version of myself would have been looking around waiting for the established elites to look at my work and give it the seal of approval. Right. So I, I would have worked my work in such a way that might have got the head nods from the, you know, the, the literature teacher or the board of the Booker Prize or the Pulitzer Prize or whatever, and try to do things that would um, be agreeable to the zeitgeist. That's right. That they would notice, and because it it's conforms to to what they're looking for. Exactly. That's right. so, yeah. so that it's going to be very easy to have such a conformist attitude towards art that it just smacks of normality or such a rebellious attitude to art that it is no longer an expression of who one really is because the rebellion kind of takes over and pushes the art out of kilter actually with yeah. personal truth and seeing the world really in an empathetic or a compassionate way, which I, I think is essential. Um, but then on the other hand, I think if you leave it too late, and again, I hope this doesn't sound like a naysaying message if you're in your 60s or whatever, but I was looking at this really beautiful writer's retreat, artist mm. getaway, and it was on this island in Greece. And it was one of these historic islands that has no cars and no motorbikes. And you go there for seven days with published author and you sit in the finest <laughs> Um, Greek hotel overlooking the, the bobbing boats in the marina and, and you put pen to paper and you talk shop and with fellow writers and I thought oh that would be cool I'd love to do that like what a what a fun experience um so I, I I looked at the audience and of course everyone on this expensive and beautiful writers retreat was in their mid-60s already and um basically it's one of these kind of retirement gifts that one can afford for themselves because they've followed the the the, the right the right path all their life 
So I looked, I looked at everybody who was attending the retreat, right? And they're all sat there with their meals very happily with a glass of wine. It looked like a lovely experience, but every, everyone is well into their 60s. And it looks like people who have retired <laughs> well, they're living off a great kind of nest egg. And they can afford to do these beautiful things like go to a Greek island and write. And then I'm thinking, well, the, the, the extreme problem with that is that if you um, wait to your 60 or 65, before you start following your artistic inclinations, then I believe that a human being has conditioned themselves in such a strong way that they probably won't be able to overcome the rigidity or their conditioning or rigidity in order to get in touch with something that's truly artistic. Hmm. This is my sense. So that in other the, words, that they, they, the turned, long... they turned a corner or something, you know? Is that what you mean? No, no, that it's hard to turn the corner. So like if uh, you've put in your decades worth of service to the bank or to the insurance company or oh, you know, working in that office on that particular kind of technology and all of a sudden you want to go to Greece and be an artist and you're age 60, you've spent 30 or 40 years of your life learning computer code or learning tax systems or learning invoicing or learning all kinds of other kind of uh, rigid, rational world you know, functional things that when at the age of 65, you want to tap into the daemon and, and cross paradigms together and create something that's on the edge and bleed I the see. heart out on the sleep, it's going to be extremely difficult to overcome that conditioning. So th this is why I'm really, I'm, I'm becoming more and more bullish about follow your passions and do your vision quest young. Yeah, me if too. You, if you have the inclination. So I, I've been watching... I like this guy, Mr. Money Mustache, right? Uh, financial independence, retire early. And this is a good <laughs> concept. Financial independence, retire early. What's not to like, right? Um, so they have this whole way that you work really hard for 10 or 15 years. You put 50, 70% of your income away, and then you can reach the age of 35 or 40, have enough of a nest egg behind you that you can live the rest of your life in retirement. Right, frugal. So yeah. And, and yeah. frugality is the name of the game before retirement. And usually when you retire, you realize, actually, I don't need that much to be happy. I'm happy already. Right. So I have fairly frugally. What, what I uh, hate, like what makes my guts cruel about, because I've really entertained this way of living, right? What makes my guts squirm with this is that in order, if, if you have any kind of artistic or passionate or romantic inclination, in order to achieve your goal, you have to sacrifice yourself to the cubicle life for 10 years. Yeah. And, and as you know, with the men that we work with, if you spend your life between the age of 21 and 35 in the cubicle, making money, filling out the spreadsheet, invoicing the customers, watching the, 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 the red and green charts going up and down on the page, and then you want to be 35 years old and you want to follow the daemon, you want to sail in the winds, you want to be able to enjoy life to a level that is infectious to have a beautiful woman want to come on your ride with you rather than mm -hmm. feel slightly bored and stilted in your company. If you want to let all that conditioning go and then become a lover or an artist, it's really hard work because you've conditioned yourself yeah. into a certain rigidity. So. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. It's an interesting. Go, go young and don't condition because of the, the, the carrot of money retirement and obviously it's e much easier said than done right to to think in myself if i want to go and pursue a real passion for literature and then like what about my coaching business which i fought tooth and nail for to start to make stable and so on and have these clients if i really like what what about that if i turn my face more about that it's the, the there's a fear of like oh i've got to a certain yeah. level here how could i in other words to, to what's this chaotic direction it, to it, devote it, your your life to Huh. the the possibility of of starving artist mode your whole life i know a guy right now who's in norway who's who's painting and and dedicated and say i'm just gonna if, if i starve i starve i'm gonna continue just doing this sort of thing right and the extreme of that would be charles bukowski who just lived right. in the streets and flop houses and 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 did his writing and you know and then the opposite of that i think I think, I think it was T.S. Eliot again, I mentioned him earlier, who wrote this sublime poetry of the age that captured the age. Was it T.S. Eliot or Wordsworth? 
No, it was T.S. Eliot, I think, who, who got a job as a banker. He was an artist. And he, had, and he was like, he, he got tired of the uncertainty of it. He got a job as a banker and he thrived. He loved being he, a banker. He was working in the bank. At the same time, he was doing all this, you know, this artistic mm-hmm. stuff. So, but that's, what I really like what you're saying is, is if we're waiting for that nest egg to accumulate, or waiting for these things to be taken care of and this debt consolidated, et cetera, get all that behind us. Then we can turn our face to the artistic realm. That's the failing. And I agree with you hundred percent. Yeah. That's why the, when you talk about a writing retreat in, in, in Greece, it's for people who want to kickstart their writing by sitting in communion with other writers, right? Yes. In other words, they're starting now and they're all in, you know, in their September years. Yeah. And like you said, they're all older and now they're going to start their writing career because I'm retired now and, I, and I, I was a banker and I did all that. And that's an interesting concept. I completely agree that if you have any desire for beauty or artistic energy or want to create a life of art, get out of society, get out of that, that, that you know, the wide, you know, the wide and, and beaten path, go down the narrow path, the road not taken. Absolutely 100% agree with that scare yourself, go into some different countries, go into different cultures, learn, learn what you're made of, learn to figure out how to stand on your two feet. You know, I completely agree with that. It's an interesting thought that the, that the people who are, have finished their careers are now wanting to turn into this artistic thing that they've been desiring since they were little kids. Yeah. It's always been there. And it might be too late to actually access that Damon. Like, yeah. true creative spark of the, 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 the guts, the gizzards, the soul. Well, you know, if you look at anything that was done creatively in the history of the world from Mozart to whatever, it was done in their early years. Now you look at someone like, uh, uh, Renoir or, uh, um, Matisse and they were painting and creating stuff. Matisse was crippled in, and he's, he's old and he's crippled and he, and he, because he can't paint anymore, he started doing cutouts with scissors and he made these incredible things that are in art museums around the world. He has cutouts and Picasso's looking at it going, wait a minute. And Picasso's old now too. He's like, should I copy that? Cause I stole everything else that he did. <laughs> but so it's like, you know, and there were some writers that were, that were writing really late in life, 90 years old. Um, excuse me, I know who they were, but I, I know, I know of some and creating artistic works at that age, but very few. You know, Freud, um, uh, Jung, all these people that they had these, this flowering of ideas and, and their artistic output. Uh, Einstein, everything was in their, was in their 20s and you know, the early years is when they created this. That's when the spark is the, the most alive and, and you have less cynicism, right, we talked about. Um, yeah, that's an interesting thought. I hadn't thought of that, what you're saying. But it's true. Go and find it now. That you, you know, the poet, the, the the poem by Kipling that I that I always quote. You know, is like, it's something there is calling you behind the ranges, behind the hills. Something there beyond civilization is calling you now. Go and find it. Go and you know, there's a poem by Kipling, and I can't remember exactly the the name of it, but incredible. It's interesting that you're tapping into this part of you, this, this spark of creativity that in, in your life, Jordan, and, you, and you've dedicated your life to it. You've dedicated your, I mean, it's, in, it's behind you in the back of the wall there, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the so crazy, cool. I'm going to go off and do what calls me for sure. And this is just another threshold, just another chapter in the book. Yeah. We had, you know, the, like I said, the actual age, in, in 800 BC, 300 BC, we had the, the Middle Ages and what came out of that, the Renaissance, uh, the Baroque period in the 1600s, Enlightenment in the 1700s, and then Enlightenment and, and materialism and humanism and naturalism arose. And we're going to we solve everything with mathematics and solve everything with scientific inquiry and everything. And the universe has the logic and order to it. And the romanticism of Blake and Shelley and, and Byron and Wordsworth and, and 
you know, Emerson and these guys were like, wait a minute, no, let's, let's rebel against this me mechanistic view of the universe and let's put flowery notes back into it and let's return to the classics. Everybody, everybody, in, if, if you were born, uh, you know, 200 years ago, you would have done the grand tour. And the grand tour yeah. was like the European would go to Italy for sure, go to Florence and go to Rome and stuff like that and, and look at the classics and try and bring the classicism you know, the, the elements of the Roman, Roman and Greek classics that were rediscovered basically in, in that age in, in the Enlightenment and re, re put it back into the art of England and put it back into the art of Western society. It's, you know, that's the romantics. They went on the grand tour. Every young man had to do that <laughs> all the way down to Greece and stuff like that. And then realism and naturalism, you know, which is, you know, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky talk about what's real and they, it's dirty. Life is dirty. Dickens wrote about it's like it's a it's a London is dirty. It's disgustingly dirty and 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 nothing to nothing beautiful. No utopia that we're talking about, right? And then you you shift from that to modernism and avant garde and and uh, Art Nouveau and you know and, and then Joyce and D. H. Lawrence, Conrad were writing these things. Yeats writing poetry, and uh, at, all the way up to you know nineteen the World War Two. With Camus, Camus wrote uh, his book in 1942, I think, this, The Stranger, I can't remember. And then now, since then, 1950 now is mass market, postmodern, anything goes, there's nothing certain. Beckett, you know, the, the cynicism of, of Samuel Beckett, um, mm -hmm. the de deconstruction of everything, modern art, uh, the artist is, is, is prime, uh, you know, deconstruction, as you said, so and inject the artist into it, breaking that, the, the, the fourth wall we talked about, pastiche, hypertext. And then the age that's coming, what are we starting? Because for sure something's happening. You can feel it mm -hmm. because of this, this, this coronavirus that's blanketing the earth. And the aggression in politics in the United States, for instance, the, the, the complete schism that's, that's happening in the States where they could, Something is ending, and I don't know if it is. I said it in an earlier podcast. Is it the end of in the Enlightenment? But something's changing, and people are are are, are realizing that we have all the trappings of fulfillment, but nobody's fulfilled. So something has to be born. Something has some some prophet in the wilderness is going to arise, or something's going to happen, and people are going to turn back to something that was classic. For instance, major a, a massive. Uh, emigration or, or turning back towards religion, organized religion. I don't know, but something's going to happen. Something shifts in the air. It, it's amazing how profound and widespread I think everyday participation with uh, spirituality, yeah, even in self help guises. Like my my mom back home teaches Reiki and meditation now. That was a very yeah. late in life find for her. So it's like in the most kind of traditional little town you know, in yeah. the midst in, in the midst of the western world there's just mushrooms of people that are asking more and more of these questions i wanted to i wanted yeah. to say first of all it's so ple pleasurable just to listen to you go through history and drop these different names and and how they were living and what they were finding what they were thinking like just to be on to be on a kind of historical, artistic, literary journey and, and just hear the tales of all these different people that lived and contributed to the lineage of that yeah. is it's so rich. Yeah. Like, that, there's so much richness. Like, I could listen for hours, like, who was this guy and who was that and why did he write this novel and what, like, philosophically, what was that on the back of and how did he play the structure to transmit a different message in a whole new way that affected people at that particular time who were living in a particular zeitgeist like that that just yeah blows my mind too jordan it's incredible yeah. to me that's why i'm so i am very optimistic for our future i've been optimistic from the, from the first day i'm not cynical at all i don't have a sense of cynicism in my body at all and i've seen some real bad things in my life you know but i'm opt optimistic because if you look at we're just this blip and on this timeline of civilization and we're living in a super interesting time. My yeah. optimism is, is uh, about the potentiality of what can be created, like the, the artistic age that can be abound out of this. 
what we talked about in an earlier podcast is the idea of frissonism, the idea of frisson, you know, the French word that means uh, goosebumps, basically, and that, and that, and nobody has, <laughs> science hasn't captured that. Nobody's talked about it. Nobody has written about it. But it's free, the age of frissonism where we feel something. And you talked about your mom talking about Reiki and stuff that all these cultures have been pulled into what we would call Western civilization. We, we talk about universal truths of the West from, from the Greeks and Romans and, you know, the British Empire and stuff like that. We have these universal truths of, of, you know, what's real. And which is, you know, what we're realizing today, it's, that's really a, a kind of like Western, Western dominated thinking, of course, right? But now those, the Orient and, and, and Asiatic cultures are being brought into. So there's, that's true globalization. You know, we have these nations, the nation states arose. But globalization is pulling in all these different influences. So now somebody can have a hint of Buddhism in his Catholicism. He's got, yeah. he's got a Stoicism and, he's, and he brings all this into his thinking. And your mother brings Reiki into, you know, alternative medicine practices and, and acupuncture that are from the East, right? You bring it all because it's all blending globalization. And yet we're, and then, and everybody wants globalization, this modern liberal culture wants globalization, but then they complain about cultural appropriation. <laughs> you can't, what do you, it's, that's what it is. It's cultural appropriation. It's, it's a blending of cultures and erasing of borders so that, you know, Germany is not Germany. England's not England. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a melting pot. Canada, where I'm from is, is famously called the melting pot because right. every culture is represented in, in, in the neighborhoods in Vancouver, you have Sikh, Sikh uh, neighbors, you have, Chinese neighbors and they, they, they're Canadian, but they hold their culture dear, near and dear to their heart. Your Sikh neighbor might invite you in for the traditional food and they, and they keep their traditions, but they're also fundamentally, ultimately Canadian. So they've really blended in, you know, and, and I don't know what I'm talking about, but it's interesting times, super interesting times. Yeah. The, the nuts thing about it is that obviously we, we can't give ourselves a, a name or a descriptor or really talk about the, the times until they're over. Yeah. So whatever phase we're in now, it's going to take 30 or 40 years until we're able to look at this particular movement and the things that were happening now with a name post postmodernism or, you know, whatever it ends up being called this new emergent thing. We'll be able to look at these black box podcast recordings of having <laughs> feeling, feeling where we're at, seeing what's going on in the world, having no idea how to describe our own motivations and our own influences and inclinations and what it was all about. And some, some clever philosopher will psychoanalyze Give it us an basically and, and basically say, oh, those people in the early 2020s, um, the new, I, I, I'd love the that word the, new, the of, new sincerity, like the, the yeah. antidote to snark and cynicism is new sincerity. Like these people came through and they wanted, wanted to speak about soul and the transcendent again, bring that through in literature. People are talking about that. Maybe a hundred years now to talk about Jordanism, that age of Jordanism. <laughs> it's like the guys that tried to write a manifesto for stuckism, stuckism. Yes. Right. Yeah. In the eighties, I think they, they did that. There's yeah. these guys said, we're going to, we manifest a new age of art called stuckism because we're stuck. So we're going to create Noble this thing. Course. And they create a manifest manifesto and, and, and consciously create the next age. If we're going to, step forward and create that age but it's like literature it's like it's like uh, high art it's not proclaimed that until after so the ism comes after when we look back in hindsight and go wait a minute that era like consumerism we can look back in the 80s and 90s and think wow that was a that was heavily consumerism and we can call it consumerism now when we're in it we didn't know we're buying you know our uh yeah 80s toys and and, and you know an optimistic lifestyle back in the 80s right is, this Incredible. is beautiful, beautifully reflected in the, uh, the Woody Allen film, uh, Midnight in Paris, where he goes back to the 1920s, right. uh, a, a modern American writer, and he, he's just like, this is heaven to me. Like, look at all these people, Hen Hemingway and Gertrude Stein, everyone is sat around and they're partying. And he thinks it's like, that was the moment when it was all happening. If we only could go back to the 1920s. Yeah. And when you listen to everybody there, they're cynical as hell. They've got nowhere like, yeah. to be. They don't they want to be in life and the prohibition. Paris is dirty, full of wretches and... They the, hate their the, life. Yeah. yeah. And the girl he met back there, remember the, the French girl he met, they, at the end of the movie, they got transferred, I'm not, I don't want to spoil the movie, but they got transported <laughs> back to an earlier time, the Belle yes. Epoque. 
And she's like, she, this, is the most, she thought, this is where it's happening. This is, this is romantic. I wish I was born in this era. And she's born in the twenties or, or she's, she's come of age in the twenties in Paris, which we romanticize and think, man, yeah. can we, if we were hanging around with Fitzgerald and Hemingway and Picasso and Gertrude Stein and, and, and we would, we would be so enthralled and so inspired and we'd be part. No, they hated their lives. They, they were, they were competing with each other. They picked at each other. You know, they, they, they couldn't stand their own work. They, they, they were suspicious of other work. They picked, it's incredible. It's all, it's all a cynical age, you know? Yeah. And wishing for well, a better past, the good old days. If, if you're a historian watching this from the 2050s and you, uh, <laughs> you want to get the inside scoop on what it was like to linger and lurk around the night spots of Bucharest back in the, back in the teens, um, yeah. I'll, I'll, sit, I'll sit there with a cigar and whiskey on your documentary and tell some tall tales. Because it's culture. It's, it's <laughs> in, a, in a rocking chair. Yeah. That's well, Zan, Zan wasn't really like how they projected him in the books. <laughs> <laughs> he did write the, the ultimate postmodern, the capstone of the postmodern age, though. He wrote the book that everybody said, this is ridiculous. Let's get back to some normalcy now. <laughs> And thereby saved culture with its very <laughs> writing. With my yeah. absurdism. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's funny, man. Wow. Here's a, here's a little concept I wanted to add to the table. Um, up here on my wall, I've got a few different archetypes. So within all the people that we work with, there's some archetypes that show up again and again and again. And I thought about the people that we work with because... Um, I wanted to get, what I mean by archetype is not like werewolf and vampire and so on, which we talk about sometimes with the archetype stuff, but it's like, what's the fundamental life circumstance that this man is in? And what are his motivations and his limiting factors and his yearnings and so on? What's yeah. ultimately okay. going to drive, drive this, this character forward? And there's millions of all of these archetypes. Um, but, but one of them I've got is the, the words need refining. The silent aesthetic amidst the culture wars. That's an archetype? Yeah. So he's an aesthete. Yes. Or he an or her. Aesthete. Yeah. So the silent to flesh aesthete. that out a little bit more, um, you know, we've talked quite a lot about the culture wars and this way of um, activism or violent activation activism or destroy the opponent kind of activism. Yeah. Rather than let's stand for the goodness and beautify what is our heart's concern form of that discourse yeah so so we're in, we're in the middle of warring factions right that doesn't yeah. need much more explanation just turn on the media any day of the week um but then there's those are the ones making all the noise and so there there is a silent i believe majority that are sat there in their university faculties in their office cubicles in in front of their kind of big king computer home work office space and they're watching these culture wars go by, saying a few things, ending up in some snark, backing off, uh, not wanting to really do much in that whole realm because whatever perspective you put out there into the world, it's kind of like sticking your arm out the window in a moving train. It might just get ripped off by some oncoming uh, ire. And I think... This is what we're. This is who we're talking to a lot in in our podcast and in the Amirati. Um, men who would like actually to stand up for something beautiful, and to stick their sword in the ground and say, "This is something I love. This is something I defend. This is something uh, of inherent beauty and meaning that I want to protect and and yeah. somehow live my life in accordance with." And so I believe in the goodness and the beauty of this. And, and here is my expression of that. Here is my, uh, I don't know, YouTube video or my book or my article or my something. And I, and I think what, what's missing for this archetype is the man who's watching this feeling really excited and really fired up. Like, yeah, I want to be part of a brand new movement that, that, that restores and restates beauty into the cultural milieu. And I really don't know how to do it because... Not only, to, not only might I get cancelled or derided by the snarky culture out there, but the second part of this is it's so easy to de... Postmodernism is so freaking easy. Let's just take a few lofty concepts from, from the philosophy lab 
take them out into the world and look at the heroes of literature and demolish them one by one for their yeah. character faults that we all have. Um, it's so much harder to sit down and say, okay, rather than uh, critique or criticize others, I'm actually going to create something I truly believe in. Like I'm, I'm Stephen King and I'm going to write my first book and I'm going to try and put it out there because I think I've got a talent. But then of course, you know, you, you, you end up contorted into this pit of self-hatred and throw your manuscripts on the fire. And so, so this artistic challenge, like I think this, this podcast episode has all been about the celebration of the daemon and the different people who had access to let's fucking do something at our time in history. Let's rewrite the, rewrite what's happening now because there's something unsatisfactory about the present moment. I want to bring in the next moment. This whole lineage of people that have been doing that, the artistic stri striving for, for generations. And it's so hard actually just to say, this is my expression. I believe in this. I want to put it out there into the world and, and, and offer this up as a gift to culture. Um, it, it's it's yeah. really rare. I think there's very little support of it. Um, we're lacking training in participatory culture in the first place. So we hit, you know, our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, never learned how to play, play an instrument, never learned how to sing, never learned how to really craft a letter, like to write a love letter. We never learned how to really craft a letter that would touch somebody because just the way our modern world has gone. And so, so with this archetype, the silent aesthetic, he sits there in the midst of all this schmagging, smart, snarky, awful, cultural, warring fighting that's going on. And it's like, how can he find himself self-express and uh, find meaning in his life? Because one finds meaning by creating beauty. You know, one finds meaning by finding and seeking and having an encounter with beauty. One finds, I think, even more meaning through creating and working with beauty. Yeah, so what's the, what is the, what's the path of that, the silent estate who's, because there is no message for him. You can't look at media. You can't look at universities. There's no message for that, that soul. There's yes. nothing that, so I mean, I, you, if you look at what we're trying to do with this Arza Murata body of work is it's, it's an antidote to snark. It's an antidote to this postmodern cynicism. I think so, right? And, and I think that both the modern and the postmodern world is so tremendously disembodied that I think mm -hmm. if you go to most faculties to learn any kind of art or self-expression that you might want to, you're going to get such a mental critique of it. Yeah. You, you're going to get all the fanciest guns, but I think art, ah, ultimately, anyone that ever created something that's truly uh, notable had to have a connection, first of all, with the body, because if you're writing from a place that is disconnected from sensation, emotion, empathy, true sensitivity, it's mm -hmm. not going to cut it. And also, whatever the sublime means to you, there has to be a connection to that as well. Otherwise, like, if you write a book that you never have Greece on during its yeah. creation, then how can you ever hope to transmit any That's kind right. of true consolation to the reader? You're only going to transmit uh, urinals. You know, okay. pages and pages of philosophical yeah. leaps and jokes and abstractions from essays. the last guy that abstracted before you. Yeah. Exactly. It's just essays and, and there's a million essays out there. We're, we're awash in essays and opinions and you're just, you're just adding to the, to the noise. I completely agree. If it doesn't touch you, if it isn't something that would, that give you those goosebumps and make you pause your life and think, you know, what am I made of and what it, what is my purpose in this, in this universe? You know, maybe there is no purpose, but at least you're contemplating that, you know? So yeah, I completely hundred percent agree with you. If it doesn't touch you, if you're not creating a, a life and an artwork out of that life, whatever that artwork is for you, and it doesn't have that, that coherence of free song that doesn't have that, that, that crying moment for you, that, that moment of contemplation. So you look at, what you've created and have this moment of 
of contemplation about it and how it affects you. And if you don't have that, then you're just, uh, then you, then you're just the part of the masses of people who just go through life as consumers that, you know, maybe they, they, they're born and they go to the grave and they consume as much as they can until they get there. And, uh, no judgment on that because maybe some people are just uncritically thinking they don't have a critical thinking. They don't, they don't contemplate and they're pleasantly happy, you know, with their, the simplicity of that. So it's no, no critique, but nobody listening to this, to this point, however long we've been talking is in that, <laughs> is one of those, one of those unwashed, uh, you know, masses, you know, part of the un unwashed masses at all. Yeah, it's got to have some curiosity and stamina for this conversation. To, be, to, to stick with this this long. <laughs> I think, what, what am I saying with this? I mean, this is, this is not fleshed out, but there are silent aesthetes among us more than I think have reared, reared their heads. And I think at least I want to create a, uh, a conversation and a forum and some kind of breadcrumb trail that they can follow to become, to, to bring somehow uh, yeah. their own light, their own fully embodied soul force into the world through the artistic things that they create. Through we've tried, we tried to foster the businesses that. they create. We, we're tried to foster that with our Amirati group of men. You know, we've had... A, this membership for over a decade and it's the men that we want to stand shoulder to shoulder with and say that's my brother and when i travel in the world i i travel i visit him or you know we sit and we break bread with these guys because they have an artistic bent they want to understand a better way of the conversation the dynamic of men and women of living their life as a as, as a creative work of art they want they want to make a jewel out of what they the best they can it's going to be an imperfect jewel and they're going to make mistakes and they're going to blow it along the way. But when they look back, they can look back with, it, with this kind of kind smile to themselves in the mirror that says, at least I tried it. At least I, I, I didn't settle and I tried to fight for this, you know? So that's what we try and do with our, our, the Amirati uh, group of guys and the women that, are, that are, are part of that experience too. And there's volumes. So, yeah. That's why you're creating, you know, we have these courses, essentials and stuff like that for the Ars Amorata philosophy. And, and, and you're constantly, and both of us, and, you know, and Serene and in our entire team is constantly reevaluating, re reinventing, rewriting, readjusting to make it more and more capture the zeitgeist and capture the, the, the true tone of what we're, we've been trying to say for, for two decades, you know? Hmm. It's true. Anyway, exciting times. Any final, <laughs> maybe uh, advice or wisdom or encouragement? Uh, putting putting yourself in the seat, in the in the ears and the eyes of somebody who's just been through this episode, who might be like, "Yeah, I, I love beauty." I I wish I had more of a connection to the arts. I wish I understood this world more. I wish I could create something that's an expression of my soul, who I am on the inside. And yeah, I have a busy life with plenty of pressures, work commitments, study. I'm afraid yeah. of not having money to live a nice life. I'm afraid of not being able to travel. I'm confined uh, because of family, children, and whatever, mm -hmm. be because of so many different circumstances. So the person listening to this, what? What's something practical they can do? Here's a better question. Since, since you and I have both um, mercilessly slaughtered ties to the, maybe the safe world mm -hmm. um, in order to live a life according to the daemon, like whatever yeah. is my full blooded inspiration, I'm going to follow that and create in accordance to that. What, what can someone do? Well, like you said, circumstances are constraint. If you murdered somebody in your 20s, you might be in jail for the next 20 years. There's nothing you can do about that circumstance. You, are, you can't say, I want to go live in a, you, you open up a, an umbrella drink shop in Bali. You can't, you, you can't do that because your circumstances are constrained. You might have three kids, like you said, yeah. but you might have a debilitating, debilitating illness, you know, a physicality that constraints and so you can't be an astronaut 
you know, like this, this power of positive thinking and the idea of the secret, you know, the secret is as you just, if you, the universe will give you what you imagine. We have constraints around that, which is called circumstantial constraints. Um, but within that, you can choose to live a life of beauty and contemplation. You can choose, I've got three children and I want you to, to, to maximize the experience of them so that they learn about culture that I was handed down, for instance, right? Um, they can learn about things as opposed to sitting on, on their phones I gave them when they're seven years old. They all got their own phones and their own Facebook account and Twitter account. Instead of that, you can give them the wholesomeness of, of being uh, present with them, to play in the dirt with them, to teach them how to do things with their hands, to teach them art you know, in, 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 in re real space, uh, which we, we don't because we're caught up in our own phones. So if you have this artistic bent then, and you have circumstances around it, if you don't have circumstances, if you have nothing holding you back but a job, leave, renounce. Renounce this, this old you, this was following the safe path, the way of the, you know, the well-beaten, trodden path. Renounce it and go on, on the path you know, less taken. Absolutely. To within the limits of your, of your constraints of your circumstances. Absolutely, you have to do that. And if you're completely constrained, like you're in prison, for instance, and you have no choice but the cell, that's your only choice, then within the, the walls of that cell, sit in the contemplation of the existence of your life on this time in the universe. And, the, and contemplate the universe. Contemplate. Learn about physics. Learn about the, the modern, these modern concepts that are just wondrous, wondrous concepts that are just fascinating look at the 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 the, the creation of the the periodic table of the elements look how that came together out of a creative dream state you know it was like it was intuited and nobody put it together and mendeleev i think it was had this was it Mende I, I, I can't remember he had this crazy dream and it's like huh huh wait, wait and he wrote it all down and it's like how did i how did i come up with this where did that come from and it was immediately apparent that it was right and it, the the scientific world looked at it the chemical world looks and goes, wow, that's right. How come we didn't think of that? I was on the edge of thinking that, but I didn't. So you could do that. Newton, you know, uh, Newton uh, created, had, had his Anna, uh, Annus Mirabilis, his year of miracles, where he created calculus because he was stuck in a coronavirus-like, uh, he, he fled London into, into, the, into, the, into the, the, the back country of England because of the plague. So he ran away from coronavirus and for a year he, he, he quarantined himself and he came up with calculus. He came up with the, the, you know, the laws of momentum and, the, and, and, and uh, planetary motions and, and the idea of gravity he came up thinking, sitting by himself, scratching his ass, thinking. The apple falling on his head, you know, apocryphally. That's in, that's in that year of, of quarantine that he created that. So circumstances do not constrain us that sense of wonder and curiosity and creative energy. That's my final thought. Beautiful. I think that's a wrap. Okay. Excellent. Another episode in the bag. In the can. And what do you say Q, to the people? Q who are listening? official. Yeah. Q official end of podcast spiel. Um, <laughs> If you've been inspired or had some uh, insight or inspiration from the conversation, drop your comment below. I was, I was also going to add, when you were saying the last little bit, if there was a book or a movie or an artist that you always intuited that you should read, but you never did because, you know, it's kind of a waste of time. It's not useful to spend mm. time reading literature or something like that. Then dig out that book and have an experience with it and let us know what you find in the comments below. And probably there, there's some old book that you picked up or you saw one time and thought, hey, I heard some people talk about that. Like, yeah, and share it I in should the comments. Read that. And let us so know what it know was. It. And let us know what experience you had when you were reading it and how, you, how it changed you afterwards to have that experience yeah. with the book. And if yeah. you know somebody that might like this conversation, then share, for sure subscribe to our channel because we're going to be putting out this and other content. Uh, and share it with others. Like if you want somebody that to hear this kind of what we're blathering on about, then share it with others too. So we can get the word out about what we're trying to, to fight for and what we're trying to create, because you're part of that, that sharing of that momentum and that sharing of this 
it's a new culture eight, cultural age that we're embarking upon and, and, and you can be part of that. Number one, by, like Jordan said, to leave behind the surly bonds of earth and go live it in, 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 in a life of artistic beauty. Like you talked about Jordan, not afraid of money, not afraid of, of all these things and share it with others. It's, it's incumbent upon you to take what you've learned to share it with others. That's incredible. That's how you learn. That's how you, that's how you inhabit it in your body, the, 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 the concepts. So very cool. We'd like to see you in yeah. the future. Cool. So uh, click, like, subscribe, all that kind of stuff that you usually find around a YouTube video. And if you want to um, stay in touch with us, you can find the newsletter on our website and the wait list also for our membership. If yeah, join the membership, the Amorati. Amorati.net. A-M-O-R-A-T-I.net. Join the membership. We have, we have a class two, three times a year. And it's, uh, it's a 90-day course. And you get in and you become part of this group that's forever, forever in this conversation. It's great. Got a great group of people. Right on. Oh, man, hey. I feel like a glass of wine. If ever I felt like a glass of wine, <laughs> tonight's tonight. <laughs> there you go, Jordan. Excellent. <laughs>